Aloha, and welcome to Figments, the Power of Imagination. I'm Dan Leaf. I go by Fig. I'm a retired Air Force fighter pilot. I served for 33, more than 33, fun-filled, action-packed years. And this could be the last episode of Figments of the Power, uh, the Power of Imagination. I don't know yet. I've got some new responsibilities that are keeping me busy, and I want to do a good job when I do do Figments. So I'll be on hiatus for probably at least a month. If you think I should continue doing this show, drop me a note at info at phase-one.com and encourage me because I need encouragement. We all need encouragement, right? So we'll see what happens there. Today, I'm going to have a solo show as I've had before, and the title is Imagine You're Gonna Die in your F-15 on the ground, ingloriously. So this is a true story. It's not very uh, self-aggrandizing by any step because I was on the ground after landing. I want to tell it straight. And the reason I want to tell it is, first of all, it's a pretty good story, and I'm very lucky. But I turned 70 last week. Can you believe that's 70? Holy crap, how did that happen? I mean, I've only been interested in going 70 in a 55. Sorry, officer. Not turning 70, but here I am at this, this point in life where... Any story about me will start with an elderly Honolulu man. Man, I am, but I'm lucky to be here. I'm very lucky to be here. Almost half of my life. In fact, today it's about 34 years in one week. Our free chicken are years that I probably shouldn't have had because of an experience I had flying my F-15, actually after flying my F-15 at Luke Air Force Base, Arizona. On August 15th, 1988, and I'm going to take you there and tell this incredible true story of survival against all odds. But remember, it's not very glorious. It's, it's not combat. It's not, uh, it's just a story. So let me set the stage for you. In 1988, I had come out of a, a non flying position at uh, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, on the outside of the bars where I taught at the Army Command and General Staff College. And I had to requalify in the F 15, which I did, and then go through a formal instructor course to uh, teach new pilots in the F 15 uh, and second lieutenants and other new pilots coming into in the airplane or those requalifying. And that required this training course that I was in on the on August 15th, 1988. In Arizona, it was a hot day, but a beautiful day, sunny. And I was scheduled for a IPC. Now, that's not an abbreviation. It was an instructor pilot C, where the student instructor, that would be me, would watch an instructor pilot demonstrate how to teach in the F-15. In this case, in a basic fighter maneuvers mission, where you go up and dogfight. Okay, that's a lot of technical garbage, but basically it's one-on-one, -on -one, go out, try to beat the other guy. Um, and we didn't have a student, so I got to play student and do my best. And it was pretty awesome, a lot of fun. And very, um, it, you know, it's a contest. And I thought I won. But let me show you the grade slip from that, that sortie, and you'll get a sense of what this was. So here you go. This is the actual grade slip. I flew with Captain Ted Ankenbauer, Ank the Crank, later flew F 16s in the Colorado Air National Guard. And the key point is highlighted in yellow there bizarre taxi back after landing, et cetera, et cetera. Lost, lost brakes, wound up off surface. Masterful job. Okay. But note the grade circle or uh, highlighted in red there. A two. Two is like, Average, not great. He did okay. It was a miraculous job of saving my life, which of course was in my own interest, but he gave me a two because that's what they always did. Fighter pilots had very high standards. So if you got a two, like it. If you got a three, wonder what the um what the instructor had been drinking because pretty tough grading criteria. So bizarre taxi back. What exactly happened? Let me discuss the plan. The plan was to go out and fly this mission. We did. We had a great time fighting, maneuvering against each other uh, in two F-15As without fuel tanks, which is kind of important. 
so they handled wonderfully and uh, two experienced guys, each with a thousand hours at least to bet 15 times is awesome. All we had to do was fly back to Luke Air Force Base to pick the deer in this Google Maps thing and uh, fly back on runway 21 right, the right end runway where you see the airplanes in what's called an overhead pattern, pitch out, land. The arm our missiles, they weren't actually armed. You had to put a safety cover over the glass nose of the training heat-seeking missile you had. Then taxi back along number three there, park along where number four is on the slide, and number five, debrief and have a cold beer. It kind of fighter pilot heaven. And, you know, all the hard stuff had already been done. We'd taken off and fought each other to maybe a stale blame, maybe I won. We'll see what Ank would, I wonder what Ank would say about that. Um, so we're done with the hard part when something interesting happened, very interesting. Now here you see an F-15 cockpit and it looks pretty complicated. As I got ready for this episode, I was reminded what a beautiful airplane that is, the F-15 and how well organized it is. So we'll, we'll leave this up here, but know that for an F-15 pilot sitting down in this this maze of gauges and and indicators and switches and everything else, very at home and very manageable task load wise. Now, any F-15 pilot watching this will notice that this picture is of an early F-15A like I was flying at Luke Air Force Base because it's got a videotape or I'm sorry, a film container to the right side of the heads-up display uh, controls, which means that we videotape hadn't even been invented, at least not in our cockpits. So we were recording our missions on real film that had to be processed and delivered to the squadron, unlike the videotape and now digital recording days. It's an, kind of an old jet, first flew 50 years ago, still in service, undefeated in aerial combat. The F-15 is a magnificent airplane, and it's incredibly redundant. I flew almost 2,000 hours in the F-15. I had some pretty serious emergencies, but this beautiful airplane was designed not to kill you, except for today. Now, you may remember that I had Mickey T, um, Colonel Retired Mike Talent, Mickey T Talent, on a couple of weeks ago to talk about how he nearly died in an F-15 uh, when it got in a flat spin because of something they didn't know about the airplane. This was before that by a couple of years, and I discovered something that wasn't known. So if we could go back to full screen here, I'm going to step you through the sequence one through five and talk about what happened, which was not on the very simple end of mission plan I showed you earlier. Up at the top of the picture, just off the picture, is something called the master caution light. It's a light that alerts you to problems. And if you've watched any of the air disaster shows on Nat Geo or another channel, you've seen that and portrayed. The master caution light comes on, tells you what to look at, and so on. It's the it's the primary alert to problems in the cockpit. I'm going to step you through what happened to me in the time it took, and then explain what was happening. So here I am taxiing back. I've had the cover put on my heat seeking missile. I'm thinking this was a great day. I think I kicked Anks, but I'm going to go debrief. Maybe he'll give me a three. He didn't. When after taxiing about 200 yards, master caution, number one. Number two, I look at the caution panel, and that's what's bordered on number two down there. It says check hydraulics. I look at, up at number three. All of the hydraulic pressure gauges are good. So I look at number four, the hydraulic bit panel back on the left console by the throttles. It says util A. In other words, the utility A system has failed. That means on number five, I pull the emergency brake and steer handle. And it hard to depict. I also had to depress a paddle switch on the stick to make sure that I had emergency brakes and steering. That's how fast it happened without reference to a checklist. In the F-15, it was such a logical, beautiful airplane, still is, that we didn't have something called boldface procedures you had to mem memorize and be able to recite verbatim. You just knew. So it went like this. Master caution, check hydraulics, utility A, emer, brake, steer handle, pull, paddle switch, squeeze, and depress. 
Now I had brakes and steering moment for a bit. The emergency brakes and steering would not last forever. So I pulled into a parking ramp and uh, thought, well, now I'll just get some chocks because of all the fantastic features about the F-15, uh, one of them was not a parking brake. It, why not? Well, I don't know. Somewhere in the design process, they said, eh, no, they don't need a parking brake. That's for wimps. <laughs> Uh, they should have thought about the fact that the F-15 had so much thrust that in idle power, idle power, just sitting there like you're idling at the stoplight, if your feet were off the brakes, the airplane would go over 100 miles an hour. That's fully fueled. My airplane was not fully fueled. We'd flown to the limits of our, get, our jet fuel on our sortie, so I was very light. I didn't have the extra weight of a fuel tank. And that meant I had a lot more thrust than I needed uh, and that I had to hold the brakes and hold the brakes and wait for somebody to come put those big wooden blocks that are called chocks in front of my wheels so that I could shut the airplane down and now go debrief and have that cold beer I was waiting for. And that's not what happened. But before I tell you what did happen, let me remind you that you can find Figments, The Power of Imagination, and the uh, show I used to do, Figments on Reality, episodes with these barcodes, and they'll stay on uh, the um, YouTube even while I'm on hi hiatus trying to figure out how much time I have for this uh, endeavor. And I'd invite you to look at them, especially look at Mickey T's, and go back and look at the Imagine I Was on the Road episode with former chief of staff of the Air Force, Dave Goldfein. Oh, that, why I say that on this episode will become clear later. Okay, so now, you know the plan. I'm going to pitch out land, de-arm, taxi back, park, cold beer, nice. What really happened? Well, what really happened was the sequence I just went through in the cockpit, which should have resulted in being chalked and um, and, and then just getting a ride back to the squadron turned out this way. With the total utility, the, the total utility failure is what I wound up with. I thought I'd had only one of the two utility hydraulic systems, A, their A and B, fail. I had nothing. With the emergency brake steer handle pull that I discussed earlier and the paddle switch depressed on the, the control stick, I should have had. Plenty of brakes and steering as needed. <laughs> Should have. That's what the Dash 1, the tech order, the owner's manual, manual, if you would, of the F-15 told me. But as soon as I called to get somebody from the area where I parked, I parked near the place where visiting aircraft parked uh, at the base, and saw the guy walking out. It's a hot day, so he was not rushing with a set of chocks to chalk my wheels. As soon as I saw him, the master caution came on again. I had reset it, and I saw check hydraulics, weird, utility pressure on those little round dials going to zero, and I had total utility failure. Boom, and the, the brakes, which are at the top of the rudder pedals, went to the floor, and my jet was rolling, rolling rapidly, it seemed. Felt very rapidly. And eventually, I would hit an F-16 and park it in the desert. The 30 to 45 seconds between feet to the floor, no brakes, and parking in the desert were pretty exciting. So I now know that I have no brakes because the airplane's rolling. Because I'd parked where visiting aircraft park. There was a jet across from me. It was a German Air Force F-4, as a matter of fact. Um, they, they had a German F-4 training program in the U.S. And if I didn't do something quickly, I was going to hit it, which struck me as bad. Now, folks, as I said, this is not glorious. Having a fender bender in your multi-million dollar single seat jet fighter, there's nothing glorious about that. Even less glorious is probably I should have shut down both engines and let the roll the airplane roll into the F-4 
there would have da been damage to both of them, but uh, I don't know. That didn't come to me until later. So what did I do instead? I'm rolling at the F4, looking right at its nose it, and accelerating rapidly in my very lightweight high thrust F15. Fortunately, I've flown the OB-10 Bronco, a counterinsurgency forward air control aircraft before, and that aircraft you steered with differential power. You had nose gear steering, but usually real men, real pilots, would steer it with differential power on one side or the other, and that would turn it. So that's what I did. All the time, I'm trying to figure out how to get brakes and steering back, because the owner's manual tells me I shouldn't be without either. So I pushed up the power on the left engine. The airplane lurched to the right, left power, airplane goes right, and missed the F4. I don't know how by how much, enough that there wasn't any crunching or grinding or braking going on. And, and now I've got to come up with a plan. I think in about two to three nanoseconds, I went through every possible switch position, including controls that had nothing to do with brakes and steering, trying to get brakes back. Uh, steering would have been really nice. Brakes were very important, but nothing. And, and again, this is counterintuitive to the max because the owner's manual says should be working fine. You pulled the emergency brake steering handle, you press the paddle switch, and I still have both in the right position, but I had nothing. So now I had to come up with an alternative plan. And the plan involved parking the airplane somewhere. And I wasn't sure how to do that. If you look at this diagram, start starting at number three and heading towards the bottom of the screen, there I have a decision. I could turn um, right or to the left of the screen and try to get to the runway and, and put down the tail hook that the F-15 had and catch a cable. But in the fleeting nanoseconds that I had available, that seemed way too complicated. And so I decided my plan would be to continue down the screen from three towards number four and um, and shut down the engines as I could and roll to a stop somewhere on the ramp that's now at sort of the very right middle. You see a little tongue of cement there. There's a parking area. I knew it was uphill. So I, I was just going to shut down the engines, roll to a stop, and let what happened happen. Seemed like an idea. So now I'm on that long, wide taxiway from three to four. I have a plan. My voice is modulated a little bit. I was talking on the radios to the folks. And I've shut down my um, left engine because I'm not going to turn right anymore. Okay, I'm going to turn to my left, to the right of the screen, and... And so I don't need more power because I'm already going faster. I would guess 40 miles an hour than I need to be, which was a lot faster without brakes than I needed to be going. And uh, so I'm cool. I have a plan. It always feels good to have a plan when things are going badly. Um, so I have a plan. Get down towards number uh, four there, and the plan falls apart because that was a common place for vehicles to transit from one side of the base to the other, taking a shortcut across the flight monitor. Then there was a blue Dodge 4x4 pickup truck with two airmen in it, security forces truck, that was coming from my left to the right, from the right of the screen to the left. And if I kept going, if I continued on plan and turned right, I was going to turn left. I was going to hit it, and I was going to die, and the guys in the truck were going to die, and there was nothing I could do about it, except not turn, and except the fact that that I'd die and they wouldn't. Now, I'd like to say that you know there was a noble intent on my part to uh, to spare their lives, but the truth of the matter is, I just uh, I, I, why hit a truck with people in it? There were some airplanes, F-16s to my right, but I didn't in the nanoseconds that you have to make decisions like this. I didn't see any people around them. And 
I was an F-15 guy, I hadn't flown the F-16 yet, so out of a lack of respect, I said, I'll hit the F-16 instead of this truck with two guys in it, and I'm dead, but they're not. And that sounds melodramatic. I knew I was dead, folks. I mean, I, as part of this, I pictured the obituary uh, telling the world that I had died in a ground accident. And that depressed me. And this, there was a flood. It, as all of this is happening, there's this flood of revulsion. I said, well, I can't say what I thought, but I didn't like that. I didn't like going the idea of going out that way. But I had no choice. So now, and I see this truck coming from my left to my right. And suddenly they, or not so suddenly, but eventually, they stopped. It's, it, it began to look that I might miss them. Hard to describe, but you know how if you're in a, at a traffic intersection or whatever, you can tell if you're going to be able to pass in front. I had that feeling. I had continued straight ahead, but I was very, very close to the F-16 that I would eventually hit. And... I thought, you're going to die anyway. I closed my eyes so as to not see the explosion that would kill me. And once now clear of the truck with two young airmen in it, I put the right throttle on the only engine still running all the way up to the afterburner, as far as it would go. And clo with my eyes closed, I felt the airplane um, turn left, and it lurched to the left. It didn't turn to the left and waited for my fiery death. I'm not kidding. Now I probably waited half a second, if that, and there was no explosion, no sound. I was alive. And I opened my eyes and yanked the power back to idle on the throttle on the left console. And couldn't believe I was still alive, looked in front of me and I saw a bunch of light bulbs and stanchions that were you know, space uh, along the edge of the paved area uh, with a little spot of desert right where number five is where it is on that chart is exactly where I wound up. And I don't, I think this is a later photo that that had um, some, uh, does have buildings down, but it was pretty much desert there when this happened. So I only have the right throttle or right engine running. I look at the two poles furthest apart uh, that are to my left so I can kind of steer towards them. I instinctively give a little squirt of power on the right engine and then shut it off so it won't be damaged when I get in the desert, won't suck up rocks and tumble, tumbleweed, sagebrush, whatever. And roll 42 feet of wingspan between two poles 50 feet apart without hitting. Wow. The airplane gets into the desert, powerless now, kind of lurches to a stop. And I think I'm alive, man. How did this happen? Now, there was such a cycle of emotions through this whole process where sometimes I'm thinking, I got this, and other times I'm sounding like Pee Wee Herman on the radio. Uh, but now I'm, I'm Chuck Yeager. No, no, no. I'm just, you know, I got this. So, People come driving and running up to the airplane. I open the canopy, put down the, the internal ladder, and I'm feeling pretty puffed up and pretty marvelous about myself. And then I got down to the desert but, uh, that the airplane's parked in. And my legs, my knees were knocking like tuning forks. So I did the brave thing and sat down in the desert so I wouldn't fall down. I should have died. Okay? I'd, I'd love to say that because I appreciated so much being alive, I didn't screw anything up for the rest of my life. But those of you who know me, that's not true. I did, however, have a pretty good appreciation for how lucky we are to be alive. Even at this advanced chronological state that I'm in, having passed seven, maybe especially. But I didn't know how it happened because when I went back and looked at my airplane, once I could walk again, 
I found there was only one bit of damage. And I can't describe this. If you had two scale models of an F-15 and an F-16, uh, you'd see that this is impossible. Over to the left of the screen on this beautiful F-15 is a, um, a dashed yellow line. On the underside of that horizontal tail was a gouge about a half inch by a half inch, half inch wide, half inch deep. It ran two thirds of the length of the tail. It was from the right wingtip light of the F-16 that I hit. So they met like this. Right? If you took two models or two drawings or compared it in any way, that's impossible. There should have been a lot more interaction between those two airplanes. Fortunately, I didn't have fuel tanks on the wing, as you see on the one in the picture, and the F-16 did not have a training missile on its wingtip rail, because even that would have created much more uh, damage. But there should have been some interaction between my wing and the, at least the tail, maybe the canopy of the F-16. It should have been horrible, but it didn't happen. And I never knew why. And because the damage was so low, it was tens of thousands of dollars to do the Bondo patch, I think. I don't remember how much, but it's well below the, the threshold for an investigation. We never did an investigation. Um, my wing commander wouldn't let me go see the two young men in the pickup truck because he figured I'd killed them, and I would have, <laughs> probably. But I never knew how I lived. And I've wondered about that as I've reflected on my good fortune being alive. And this is where we get to Dave Fingers Goldfein, former chief of staff of the Air Force, and just how lucky I was. Years later, 10 years later, I arrived at Aviano Air Base, Italy, and I was the wing commander there. Dave Goldfein was the commander of the world famous, highly respected Triple Nickel, America's greatest fighter squadron. And I say that with due reverence because after this incident at Luke Air Force Base, I commanded the triple nickel. And uh, so we had that connection. Shortly after I got to Aviano as the one-star wing commander, Lieutenant Colonel then, Goldbeam, and I were standing in the squadron lounge, also known as Bar, having a cold beer one Friday night with the rest of the pilots. And he said to me, hey, sir, were you at Luke when that guy had total failure and no brakes and steering and oh, it's time for Steve Canyon Chuck Yeager to come out as a was I why that was me it's a, it was amazing I've never seen anything like it and my first thought was what I sounded like talking on the radio through this because I was making calls to ground control and I'm I said I sounded like Pee Wee Herman didn't I oh no you sounded good sir now remember I'm its boss at the time so that was the right thing to say, but I'm pretty sure I didn't sound so cool, calm, and collected. And I said, Fingers, Colonel Goldfein's name, uh, nickname, I don't know how I live. I mean, it doesn't make sense to me. I've never been able to figure that out. He said, oh, I do. He said, I was in the airplane behind the one you hit. In fact, I thought I was in trouble. It sounded like you had everything contro under control, and then you didn't. And I consider it ejecting if you hit the plane one row in front of me. And said, but then at the last second, when you pushed up the power on the right engine, the, the right wing of the F-15 and the right main landing went up and the right main landing gear actually lifted off the ground and everything barely passed over the Viper, the F-16 that you hit. That's how close I came to not even make, barely making it halfway to 70. So being 70, I'm very grateful. Very grateful to have been able to share with you, share my experiences, my friends, some of my life lessons on figments. I hope I can find my way back in a month or two. We'll see what happens just in terms of workload now. So let me close with what, what's, my, what's my figment, my next thing. Uh, my next thing is always peacemaking, okay? Because I've made war. Peace is hard, much harder than war. There's a lot of peace to be made in the world. So whether it's on a local basis, an individual basis, or bigger than that, um, that's what I want to do with the rest of the time. 
that I have. So now what would Fig do? Live your day like it might be your last, because guess what? It might be. Fortunately for me, it wasn't. Uh, I am very lucky to be here and very grateful. And I'm especially grateful to um, Think Tech Hawaii, a wonderful nonprofit that you should donate to for letting me be one of the citizen journalists doing 30 shows a week here on Think Tech and trying to inform the conversation. So until next time, and I hope there's a next time, aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.